Meanwhile, worldwide coronavirus infections have now topped 200,000. Almost 6,500 cases have been confirmed in the United States, nearly 2,000 more than at this time just yesterday. 114 people here have died. In his latest op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, CNBC contributor Dr. Scott Gottlieb talks about the capacity of the U.S. hospitals and how there still could be time to flatten the curve of the rising number of cases. Dr. Gottlieb joins us now on the phone. He's also the former FDA commissioner, of course, and serves on the boards of Pfizer and Illumina. And um, we are always grateful to have his expertise with us. Good morning to you, doctor. Um, let's talk about flattening the curve for a second, because there have been lots of steps that have now been taken over the past several days across this country uh, and in this state and city where we are right now in New York. And as people are trying to look at the timeline of what this may or may not be, the president, of course, mentioned July and August recently. Investors are trying to figure out uh, what this timeline looks like. Of course, the timeline gets extended out, the better we do in terms of flattening the curve to some degree. What are you, what are you seeing in terms of estimates and how that flattening is changing, or is it? Well, we're, we're, thanks for having me this morning. We're certainly having an impact on the scope of this epidemic and the contours of this epidemic and how, how many cases we're going to get at the peak and how long it's going to last. The steps we've taken in the last two weeks are very aggressive. I, I think I'm, I'm heartened by what the mayors and the governors have been willing to do. These are strong actions. I think the president's reference was probably to the analysis that's, that's circulating in Washington and the White House. It shows this peaking out late April, early May. Remember, if you peak in, in April, if you're in the end of April, seven weeks from now, you still continue to accrue cases for another seven weeks. That's just the peak. It comes down. So that analysis would show this epidemic continuing the course into late June, and that, right. that gets you into July. So I think that might have been what he was referring to. I'm not okay. sure. Doctor, can you, can you just, on, on that peak issue, though, so let's say we're in a late, late April, early May situation. It gets extended out through the end of, of June, and maybe that's the way businesses should think about this, investors should think about it. If that's the case, though, the, the social distancing steps and everything else that we're taking today, in your mind, they need to last through the end of June? I mean, I, I'm trying to understand if people look at the peak, and because people look at what, what took place in China and elsewhere, and after it started to peak out, as you know, at least in China, some people started to go back to work, and you start, you start to see an increase of business again. Is that the right way to think about it or not so much? I think it's going to be very hard to take our foot off the brake if we're still accruing cases. Um, and that's why I think a lot of school closures are going to be in perpetuity. Probably the school year is lost for a lot of these districts where there is community transmission um, because you don't want to lift the restrictions too quickly and then have another uh, resurgence right. in cases. But you can, you can lift them and then put in place other measures. And so, for the example, you know, one of the things we might contemplate is do we require people to wear not N95 masks, which are in short supply, but procedure masks? If we know there's asymptomatic spread or mildly symptomatic young people spread this virus, the procedure masks aren't in short supply. Um, it's the N95 masks that the healthcare workers need. So there might be other things we can substitute in uh, that could provide some protection as, as transmission slows down right. and the risk isn't as great. What, what do you know about the supply chain in terms of masks, in terms, you know, uh, Becky had asked about ventilators uh, to several of our guests this morning. Administrator Verma, I, I think she might have even, at one point, I think when we had asked about, you know, where they were or how many we had, there's not there's not an actual a real number out there right now uh, that that people want to distribute or I mean when I say distribute uh, disclose rather. Yeah, we we have ventilators in the national stockpile. Um, one one official over the weekend used the figure of twelve thousand seven hundred. I think it might be slightly more than that, but not much more than that. That's in the stockpile, and I'm sure there's there's some on order now as well. Um, but there aren't a lot. There aren't hundreds of thousands of ventilators in the stockpile. Um, there, there could be low tens of thousands of, of ventilators in the stockpile or, or that something around that 12,700 figure. Um, and then nationally, you have about 62,000 full-featured ventilators and then another 100,000 partial-featured um, ventilators. But those, those are also assisted breathing devices like CPAP um, devices or BiPAP, and you wouldn't want to use those in this setting because they can actually spread virus. So you really have to focus on those 62,000 um, full-featured ventilators. And that's a figure from 2010. It's a little bit old. Right. The figure that I used in the Wall Street Journal uh, today is 100,000 ventilators either available or in the stockpile. And I think that's a pretty safe estimate. Hey, Dr. Gottlieb, uh, I want to bring Becky into the conversation. Bex? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, D Dr. Gottlieb, just something you just said about the CPAPs and not wanting to use them right now because they could uh, spread the virus. If you are an older person using a CPAP right now or somebody with an underlying condition using a CPAP right now, should you stop using it for the duration of this virus? 
No, anyone who needs it for a medical reason should should use. It. I'm talking about in a hospitalized setting, a, a machine that okay. provides some pressure. Um, you know, that isn't in a uh, an enclosed room where you can actually blow virus around. No, certainly anyone at home who's on on any assisted uh, breathing device should continue using it. Doctor, in terms of, I mean, we've been talking to you literally daily, and so trying to understand the progress that's being made one way or the other. Um, you know, if you look at what's taking place in Italy, the numbers continue to ramp. Um, how much should the United States take away from that experience relative to the experience of South Korea? I think one of the other things investors um, and, frankly, policymakers are trying to do is look at these different models, and it's very hard to ascertain why certain things are happening in certain regions. Well, I think what South Korea did was very aggressive testing right at the outset and, and um, an effort to contain and isolate people. Uh, they tested one in 200 people in South Korea, and they even tested you know, young people. Right, right now in the U.S., even though we have more testing capability in terms of platforms, we're still not able to test everyone. Certain people are being told to just stay at home and assume you have coronavirus. The problem with that is that if you don't have a positive test result, you're probably less likely to self-isolate and take it seriously, and you also can't enforce the quarantine without a positive test result in most cases. So testing people and telling them they have it could be very helpful. Um, in Italy, th there were a couple of things that went wrong. Number one, people showed up at the hospitals right. when they were sick, and they spread the virus in the hospitalized setting. It's an older population. There's higher smoking rates. So there's reasons why Italy, the background in Italy, was more conducive to a bad outcome relative to what our experience could be if we do the right things.